I'm curious if any of you remember a breakfast called Kellogg's Breakfast Mates. Does anybody remember Breakfast Mates? No? Well, let me refresh, let me refresh your memory. Because there's a hundred little things to take care of in the morning, two of which are hungry. Introducing Kellogg's Breakfast Mates, a bowl of Kellogg's cereal, milk, and spoon all in one. It's one less thing to worry about. Make breakfast easy. Is that it? Did it freeze? Technology is not my friend this morning. Uh, I, I want to say we're in a series called The Table, and if The Table is a symbol of everything that's right about life and love, Breakfast Mates is a symbol of everything that is wrong. Kellogg's actually pulled Breakfast Mates off the shelf after about a year, uh, but it, it was despite the fact that it was very convenient as kids could make breakfast for themselves while their parents slept in or got ready for work, despite the fact that it allowed kids to watch television while they ate their breakfast, it actually failed, and it failed not because kids ate breakfast alone, not because of the artificial ingredients, after all, most of the popular foods these days have lots and lots of artificial ingredients. It wasn't even the fact that it cost five times the amount of a normal cereal in a normal packaging. It failed because it turns out people don't like warm milk. Now it was created to not need refrigeration, but it's kind of disgusting for most people to pour warm milk over their cereal. And even, even when they begin selling it in the refrigerated section, it kind of defeats the purpose of a cereal on the go. And eventually the milk would be warm anyway. But the truth is, there is a lot that we lose when we settle for eating a meal on the run or eating a meal in front of the television. Food is something that is good to eat. It is that, but it is far more than that. In this series, we're talking about how food is something that is also good to do. Food is something we can connect with, with other people. It's something that we, it's good to think over. It's good to relax by. It's good to romance around. Even the imaginary Greek and Roman gods sat down together for dinner at least once a day, and they didn't even need food to survive. When we lose this table, when we lose the table, we lose a lot. Our meals become less satisfying. They become less nutritious. In the Gospels, Jesus often referred to the kingdom of heaven as a banquet or a feast. In fact, in Luke chapter 14, he tells a parable about a great banquet, and he talks about how everyone is invited. In Matthew chapter 22, he begins a story by saying these words. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. And so what is heaven in the Gospels? It is a great banquet, a great feast. And if heaven is pictured as a great wedding banquet, then what is hell? Well, hell is often depicted by artists as eating alone. A few years ago, my family visited Chicago, and we went to the Art Institute of Chicago. And to this day, that visit and that day is one of my favorite top five things that we've done as we've traveled across this great country of ours. If you ever get a chance to go to the Art Institute of Chicago, I highly recommend it. Many of our inside jokes in our family to this day come from that visit. But one of the things I got to see, one of the things I made sure that I saw is a painting there by Edward Hopper called Nighthawks. This is a pretty famous painting they have there at the Art Institute of Chicago. It is one of the best known paintings of the 20, uh, 20th century. Um, and the painting depicts an all-night diner. It's got three customers there, if you can see there. Two of them are together, one of them is alone. But all of them seem sort of lost in their own thoughts. Now, Hopper has actually denied that he purposely infused this painting or any of his paintings with symbols of human isolation or urban emptiness. But even Hopper admitted about Nighthawks, quote, it is unconsciously probably I was painting the loneliness of a large city. Almost all of us can fill the emptiness of what it would be like to eat alone while surrounded by people. That is a disorienting and lonely feeling. There is value in choosing 
relationships over isolation and making time to eat together even when time is scarce. Now, I understand that every parent has to feed their kids somehow, some way. And if you choose to feed them Big Macs while watching television, you have made a value statement. And that value statement is, our family connection is less important than your entertainment. Or, I'm too busy to have to deal with you while you eat. Maybe you're a single parent, or maybe you work late and have limited time to cook. Maybe you have limited funds, and maybe you have to find value where you can in food. That is not what this is about. What this series is about is the choice of spending time together wherever you can find it, at least several times a week, having a meal around a table, where you can connect together and talk together and bond together and share food. When we don't eat with other people, when we eat alone, our meal becomes a little bit lifeless. Speaking of lifeless, who are the first two human beings on earth? Pop quiz, who are they? They were named what? Adam and Eve. Now, do you know what that word Adam is, or Adam in the Hebrew? It actually means from the earth, or uh, from the ground. After all, you remember that Adam was made from the ground, or as my professor used to say, Adam means dirt clod. That's what it means in the Hebrew. It means dirt clod. But do you know what Eve means? Eve means living or life. So it turns out old dirt clod needed someone else before he could fully come alive. And thus Eve entered the picture. From the beginning, we were meant to eat together, not solo. Now, when Genesis chapter 2 ends, everything is going swimmingly. The, Adam and Eve are in the garden, and they're happy, and God walks with them, and everything is marvelous. Adam has Eve. The, Eve has Adam. There is nothing in between them. In fact, the very last verse of Genesis chapter 2 says they were both naked, and yet they felt no shame. And then Genesis chapter 3 begins this way. It says, The serpent said to Eve, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. He says, in fact, you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and she ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. And then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked and so they sewed fig, tree or fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Verse 8, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden of the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees in the garden. As soon as sin enters the world, what begins happening? A whole lot of hiding. Immediately when sin enters the world, we have a whole lot of hiding. And yet, despite their hiding, God goes seeking. That's what the text says in verse 9. It says, But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? And he answered, I heard you in the garden, but I was afraid because I was naked, and so I hid. If anyone ever stops by unannounced and you don't answer the door, Genesis chapter 3 verse 10 is a terrific excuse on why you didn't. I was naked, so I was afraid, so I hid. I, that's why I didn't come to the door. And that's what's going on here, is he's recognizing for the first time, I have something to be ashamed about. And so what is he doing? He's literally hiding from God. He tells God that. I'm hiding from you. Verse 11. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Which we know God is not asking this question because he not, does not know the answer. He's asking this as we parents often do of our children when they've done something wrong. Did you eat that cookie? We're looking for a confession, an acknowledgement. You know, yes, I did, and, and, and it was indeed wrong. But look what the man says. The man says, Adam says, The woman you put me here with, she gave me some of the fruit of the tree and I ate it. Hey, don't look at me. It was her fault. And then the Lord God says to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman says, It was the serpent 
The serpent deceived me and I ate. You can see that not only are Adam and Eve hiding from God, they're hiding from a whole lot of other things as well. First of all, they're hiding from themselves. As they cover themselves up, as they sew clothes out of fig leaves, they're hiding from themselves. And they're hiding from each other. They immediately start blaming each other for what has gone wrong. No, it was her that made me do it. And Eve's like, no, 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 it wasn't, it wasn't me, it was the serpent. Adam blames Eve, Eve blames the serpent, and suddenly there's a whole lot that has come between them, and as a result, they're both hiding from God. And by rupturing their relationship with God, it is rupturing their relationship with each other. And while that is the very first time that it ever happened, that hiding has gone on and been repeated over and over and over and over again. There has been a whole lot of hiding ever since, because what do we do? We hide from ourselves. From God, we hide from each other. When we feel exposed, when we feel vulnerable, we hide. We isolate. We avoid. We overcompensate. And the rest of the Bible is really a story of hide and seek. As mankind goes into hiding, God goes into seeking. As we hide from God, God seeks us out. He wants to repair the relationship. God's mission in the world is to restore the relationship of a hard-headed and rebellious people. And in spite of our attempts to to have fake personalities and to get along with others and mask our insecurities, he's still going to seek us out. Now, there's a very powerful word in the Hebrew. Maybe the most powerful word in the Hebrew is the word hineni. That word hineni is actually two words put together, and those two words are, behold me. But most often in the English, it is translated, here am I, or here I am. That is the word, hineni, in the Hebrew. Abraham says it in Genesis chapter 22, verse 1, when God calls his name, and the very next thing God calls him to do was to sacrifice Isaac. And then, Abraham says it again in verse 11 of Genesis 22 when the angel of the Lord stops him from slaying his son. In Genesis chapter 31, when God appears to Jacob in a dream, what does Jacob respond? He responds, Hineni, here I am. And he goes on to leave Laban and start out on his own and create what would become the nation of his new name, Israel. When Moses hears God speaking from the burning bush, what does he say? He says, here am I. Here I am, Hanani. When God calls Samuel as a child several times, how does Samuel respond? He responds by saying, here am I. In Isaiah chapter 6, when Isaiah gets a peek into the throne room of God, the famous calling of Isaiah, he realizes he is a man who is unclean. He says, I am a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. But how does he respond to God's call? He says, here am I, here am I, here I am, God. Hanani. That's what he says. Here I am is this no more hiding, no more concealing. It is the opposite of hiding from God. It is the opposite of hiding from each other. It is saying, here I am. And I want to say, when we aren't regularly eating meals around a table from, with each other, then we are hiding from each other. Sometimes we even use that language. Oh, you know, where's the teenager? He's hiding in his room. And in a way, the table is about coming out of hiding. It's about saying those very powerful words. Here am I. Here I am. I'm here. Because the table sort of requires us to unconceal ourselves. You know, despite our faults and despite our failures, despite our distractions and our disagreements, we still can say to each other, here here I am. This is me. The table is a place to reconnect with God and to each other. And when we gather at a table, we push back the isolation that we so often feel. Because at the table, at the table we can slow down and talk. How was your day? And then we can listen to the answer. At the table, we can talk about what we experienced that day. And we can talk about what we plan for tomorrow. We can talk about what is important to us, what is interesting to us. We can hear each other. We can understand what the other people are experiencing. At the table, your children can understand what life is like as an adult for you. 
And you can understand what it's like to be a child today for them. You share your highs, you share your lows, you share your plans and your ideas. It might be easier for everyone to grab a breakfast mates and everyone to go their separate ways, but there is value in inconveniencing ourselves for each other's sake. But I want to tell you this morning, there is something else that eating together creates besides just relationships. It creates our tastes. What is it? Why does one person love blue cheese and another person find it revolting? How can one person think that mushrooms on a pizza ruin it and another person think that mushrooms on a pizza makes it taste great? What is that? It is taste, isn't it? It is taste. Well, where do we acquire our tastes? The answer to that is it's complicated. Taste is a product of more than just the buds on your tongue. Taste is also a product of your genes and your environment. Tastes are not, believe it or not, inherent in who we are. They're negotiated between the uniqueness of ourselves as individual, but our, our association with a particular culture. In other words, taste can be tribal. It can be cultural. I'll prove it to you. Raise your hand if you could finish this sentence. My grandmother taught me to eat blank. Can you, can you finish that sentence? Raise your hand. Let me show, show of hands. Or, or how about this? My grandfather taught me to eat. Can you finish that sentence? How many of us? Or my uncle or, or, or maybe even a sibling or, or someone else or my friend. Someone taught me to eat blank. In other words, I've acquired this taste. Taste can be train. The fact that you can finish that sentence that so-and-so taught me to eat such-and-such proves that tastes can be acquired. They can be trained. And tastes are trained a little bit like holiness is trained. It doesn't happen all at once. You don't suddenly have good taste any more than you suddenly are holy. Training in anything takes time, including taste. Now, there is a pope, Pope Gregory I, who lived way back in the 500s, who would disagree with me, because around 600 A.D. he defined five aspects of gluttony, and one of them included, quote, seeking out delicacies to gratify the, quote, vile sense of taste. Now, Francis of Assisi lived about 700 years after him, and I think he and Pope Gregory would have gotten along swimmingly because Francis of Assisi kept a pouch of ash on his person at all times to put on top of his food in case it tasted too good. Because heaven forbid your, t your food actually tastes good. There is something to be said for taste. There's something to be said for the fact that there is no exact right way to live the Christian life. Your music, your clothes, your food, your driving, your furniture, your library, even the coffee you drink is all a matter of taste. Now, I have a taste for the color gray. So much so that I gravitate towards it whenever I'm buying clothes or even when I'm purchasing a vehicle. But Kimberly West back there has a taste for the color purple, as you can see by her hair. Sorry, Kim. What's interesting is Kim loves the color purple, but Kim's love for the color purple and my love for the color gray, it doesn't divide us, does it, Kim? Not at all. And we don't conceal our taste from each other. We're fully aware of that, and we can remain friends. You see, acknowledging our different tastes, it doesn't end conversations. It starts them. And that is part of what the table is all about. Taste is actually a really big deal. It's a big deal to learn the difference between George Strait and Gershwin. Or Maroon 5 and Mozart. Our tastes are matters of both absolute and necessity and kind of utmost indifference. There is value in discussing and even disputing taste. It is very fun to me to get someone who loves to eat tuna to explain why eating something that smells like cat food is a good thing. <laughs> it's just a matter of taste. All taste. All taste is acquired taste. 
And the table is where we acquire our taste. The table is about acquiring tastes. The table can be the place where we teach our kids how to behave at a meal. But it can also be the place where we teach our kids a whole lot more than that. We can also teach our kids how to behave in the world. In fact, we can teach our kids at the table how to live in the world, but not of the world. As Jesus told his disciples in his teaching, he said to them, there are some things that are acceptable for other people. But then he turned to them and he said this in Matthew 20, verse 26. But he said, not so with you. That is what this conversation of tastes around our table can be, right, can be about. There are things that are right out in the world. There are things that they're going to do out in the world. There are tastes that you're going to acquire out in the world that aren't for you. Not so with you. Those are very powerful words that Jesus said that we can say around the table. The number one hindrance for most family to household discipleship, it's lack of time. And yet, we have to eat every single day. Exodus chapter 12 is a perfect example of using mealtimes in the spiritual formation of your family. That is the passage in which God instructs parents to teach their children about his deliverance through an illustration of a meal. Now, they would call it the Passover meal. And what's interesting is, even though Jesus didn't have children, he also used the Passover meal to teach his disciples. That was the moment he used to spiritually form the tastes of his closest followers. God, in all his wisdom, created people with the need for food and nourishment, thus providing families with a perfect opportunity to speak truth in the life of their children. Use your table talk, use your table time as a time to teach your family about their tastes. You know, home can have a lot of different connotations. Home, to me, may not be home to you, and I recognize there are some people that are homeless. So what does it mean to set the table in our home? It means that Wherever we are present with those close to us, whether our home is in the home of another, whether our home is on a street corner, whether our home is in a tiny apartment or a huge house, we set the table in our home when we invite Jesus into our personal space and share that space together with those that we call family. And restoring the table to your home not only strengthens the bond of your relationship with God and your family members, it gives you the security and the emotional stability and the spiritual maturity to recognize God as the giver of every good gift. Gathering around a table at home with our family allows us to say what the psalmist sang in Psalm 34 when the psalmist said, Taste and see that the Lord is good. When you set the table in your home, you invite all of those in your family to do that. To taste and see that the Lord is good. Let's pray about that. Lord, we see the power, the value of the table. We're seeing it, Lord, as we go through this series. And we see that, Lord, uh, we are somewhat condemned this morning by the story of Adam and Eve and their hiding because we have followed in their footsteps so in so many ways, so many times, Father. We do at times hide from ourselves and hide from each other and indeed, Lord, shamefully hide from you. But we are thankful that you're a God of seeking us out. That you're a God of restoration. You restore that relationship and you bring us out of hiding, Father. We thank you for forgiving us of our sins, providing a pathway to heaven with you someday by belief in your son, Jesus. Lord, we pray that we can share the table with him, with our family. We pray that we can follow his example of teaching the, poor, the people in our lives that are important to us uh, these, spiritual, these spiritual truths, Father, around a table of food. We pray that you will help us come out of hiding, hiding from ourselves and each other by sitting at the table and eating with the people that we care about. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.